Just in time for Halloween, we're going to take a look at the skeleton. As always, in the lecture portion of this course, we're focusing on big picture stuff. And in the laboratory, you're learning all the terminology that applies to specific anatomical structures. Having said that, though, I am going to give you an overview of the regions of the skeleton, and I will go into a bit of detail on the axial skeleton. We'll also talk about the development of the skeleton. There are 206 bones in the human skeleton. We can divide the skeleton up into two broad regions. We have the axial skeleton, which consists of bones that are found within the longitudinal axis of the body. And then we have the appendicular skeleton, which consists of the pectoral and pelvic girdles and the limbs. So the axial skeleton in this diagram is shown in blue, and it would include the bones of the skull, the hyoid, which is a bone that's found in the throat, and it provides attachment for the larynx, the vertebrae, which of course comprise the spine, the ribs that are attached to the thoracic vertebrae, the sternum, or breastbone, and also the ear ossicles, which are the little tiny bones that are found within the middle ear. The appendicular skeleton, as mentioned, would consist of the pectoral girdle, so that would be the scapula and clavicles, and the arms, and also would consist of the pelvic girdle, the bones that make up the pelvis, with, with the exception of the sacrum, of course, it's part of the axial skeleton, and then, of course, the legs as well. We can also classify bones based on their shape. We have long bones that are found in the appendicular skeleton. As the name suggests, their length exceeds their width. They're generally roughly circular in cross section, so they're not flattened bones. We have short bones, things like the carpals and the tarsals. So those are found within the wrist and the ankle, respectively. We have flat bones that can be found in either the appendicular or axial skeleton. So the bones of the cranium, the bones that surround and protect the brain, they're flattened bones, things like parietal bones, for instance. Within the appendicular skeleton, we have the sternum, the scapula, the bones that make up the coxa of the hips. Those are all flattened as well. We have irregular bones that have irregular shapes. The vertebrae would be an example of that. But within the skull, we have things like the mandible and the maxilla. Those are also irregular. Sesamoid bones are roughly shaped like a sesame seed. That's what the word sesamoid means in Latin. We have two very large sesamoid bones, and those would be the kneecaps or patellas. But we also have many smaller sesamoid bones. These are found within the hands and the feet. Everyone will have patellae embedded within their patellar ligaments. There are a few other sesamoid bones that are found in nearly everyone. So in the x-ray at the bottom here, you can see that we have this sesamoid bone here in the hand. Again, it's found in nearly every person. And this is found embedded within a tendon that crosses the metacarpal and first phalange of the thumb. Likewise, Pretty much everyone is going to have sesamoid bones on the plantar surface of the metatarsal and first phalange of the great toe. So again, we have tendons crossing that gap, and then we have these sesamoid bones that develop within the tendons to help protect the tendons. The occurrence of other sesamoid bones is far more variable. What you're seeing here are sesamoid bones and their frequency of occurrence in the foot and in the hand. Notice that we also have accessory bones, which are quite similar, that are associated with joints within the ankle. We'll start our overview into the major bones of the skeleton by looking at the skull. Again, though, remember, you will be expected to know the skeleton in quite a bit more detail for the laboratory portion of the course. So the skull is by far the most complex bony structure within the body. It's made up of 22 individual bones, although many of those bones will fuse together during development and on into adult life. We have two main divisions. We have the cranium and we have the facial bones. The cranium consists of the bones that surround the brain and protect the brain. In fact, it's quite often referred to as the brain case or neurocranium. 
Then we have the facial bones, which, as the name suggests, make up the structure of the face. They also provide openings for the passage of air and food, and they're anchor points for the muscles that are involved in facial expression. Not counting sutural bones, there are eight cranial bones in most adults. Two parietal bones, two temporal bones, one frontal bone, one occipital bone, one sphenoid, and one ethmoid. Now I say in most adults because some adults will have nine bones. They'll have two frontal bones. It's important to note that during development, we start off with paired parietal bones, paired temporal bones, and paired frontal bones. But in most people, those two frontal bones will fuse together. Generally, by the time you're two years old, these bones have come together and the suture is in the process of disappearing. And by the time you are seven, any sign of that suture has completely disappeared. However, in some people, the suture will be retained as something called a metopic suture. And this can be a small little remnant of the suture, generally just in the forehead here, or the suture can run the entire length of the frontal bone. And this isn't a problem. It doesn't present any issues. It's something to be aware of though, because you don't want to look at an x-ray and mistake that suture for a fracture. The cranial bones, despite being quite thin, are remarkably strong for their weight. They are flat bones, and we'll talk about their development in a little bit. The sphenoid bone is quite often described as being butterfly-shaped or bat-shaped. It sits at the base of the cranium and connects to many other bones of the skull. It contains a little fossa called the hypophysial fossa. Remember, a fossa is a depression, and this contains the pituitary gland. The ethmoid bone forms part of the nasal passages. Note that we have sinuses within the ethmoid, and then we have structures known as conchae. Incidentally, concha is singular, conchae with an AE at the end would be plural. And what the conchae do is they increase the surface area within the nasal passages so that there's more surface over which you can trap debris from the air and also warm and moisten the air before it goes down to your lungs. At the top of this bone, we have what's called the cristagalli, and this is a ridge that sticks up into the cranial cavity. On either side of that, we have the cribriform plate, which looks like it's got tiny little pinholes in it, and those little pinholes are where nerves that come from olfactory receptors, smell receptors, travel up to the olfactory bulbs so that the information you get from smelling stuff can travel back to the brain. The facial bones make up the framework of the face and also nasal passages. We have 14 bones and all of them are paired with the exception of the mandible and the vomer. So we have paired maxillae. Again, maxilla would be singular, maxillae is plural. We have the zygomatic bones, the nasal bones, the lacrimal bones, the palatine bones, and also bones known as nasal conchae. Uh, we already talked about conchae when we talked about the ethmoid, but there are other conchae that are separate from the ethmoid. The mandible or jawbone is the largest and strongest bone of the face. It's one of the strongest bones in the body. It connects to the temporal bone at the temporomandibular joint. One thing that's interesting to note is that in most mammals, there are two separate bones that make up the jaw, even in the adult. But in humans, although we start off with two ossification centers, they grow together into one bone and there's no sign of a suture uh, on the chin as there would be in a lot of other mammals. The maxillae or maxillary bones make up the majority of the face. So this is a paired bone. We have a right and left maxilla, although they generally fuse together in adulthood. The drawing on the left, now that I'm looking at it, is a little bit misleading. It looks like the zygomatic is part of the maxillary bone, and of course it isn't. The maxillary bone or maxilla contains the upper dentition, so our upper set of teeth. The zygomatic bones form what we generally refer to as our cheekbones. They form the anterior part of the zygomatic arch. 
Note that we have two processes shown here. Remember, a process is a sticky out bit. It's a projection that sticks out from the bone. One is known as the frontal process. It's going to articulate with the frontal bone. And then the temporal process is going to articulate with the temporal bone. And that's the part that's going to form part of the zygomatic arch. This bone is also going to articulate anteriorly with the maxilla. The other facial bones are the nasal bones. These are paired bones that form the bony bridge of the nose. We have lacrimal bones that are found in the medial corner of the eye socket, the orbit, and they contain a deep groove that contains the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac collects tears that wash across the eye and then it directs that fluid down into the nasal cavities. Lacrimate means to cry in Latin. And then we have the palatine bones, which form the back part, the posterior part of the hard palate. And there's a little projection that goes up into the orbits as well. The vomer is an unpaired bone that runs right down the middle. So it runs right along the mid sagittal plane of the body. And together with the ethmoid and with some cartilages, it makes up the nasal septum that divides nasal passages into right and left. Leaving the skull, let's take a look at the rest of the axial skeleton, starting with the vertebral column. We have five regions to the vertebral column. We have the cervical vertebrae, and those are the vertebrae of the neck. We have the thoracic vertebrae, and those are the vertebrae of the thorax. We have the lumbar vertebrae of the lower back. We have the sacrum, which consists of five fused vertebrae, although that can vary. People can have four or even three in some cases. And then below that, we have the coccyx, which is also quite variable, but typically consists of four or fewer fused vertebrae. So just looking at these in more detail, the cervical vertebrae, there's seven of them. And this is a defining characteristic for all mammals, actually. It doesn't matter if we're looking at dolphins or giraffes or mice they all have seven cervical vertebrae. They're different lengths, of course. The thoracic vertebrae, we have 12 of these, and they're defined by the fact that they have ribs attached to them. And if you're looking at one of these vertebrae in the lab, you'll be able to see the little facets where the head of the rib articulates. Lumbar vertebrae, these are big, beefy vertebrae. They have a very large centrum or body, that's because this part of the skeleton is subjected to a lot of stress. It's maintaining the weight of the upper body and transferring that down to the pelvis. The sacrum is going to articulate with the coxal bones of the pelvis. You can see individual vertebrae here, but they're fused together. So there's no movement between the, the fused vertebrae. And then we have the coccyx, which consists of caudal vertebrae. Caudal means tail vertebrae. So this is what's left of our tail. We still have these bones that have fused together, and this entire structure may also fuse to the sacrum as well. I should point out, a lot of people say sacrum. That's perfectly acceptable. The name comes from the fact that this is considered a sacred bone by many cultures. So Romans, for instance, they would sacrifice a goat, they would rip out the sacrum, and they thought that they could um, foresee the future by the shape of the sacrum. Kind of like reading tea leaves, but a little bit gorier. There is a curvature to the spine. You're seeing the natural curvature here, but we can have abnorations. We can have scoliosis where we have a curvature side to side. There shouldn't be any curvature side to side. We can have lordosis where we have an exaggerated curvature in the lumbar region. The bony thorax or thoracic cage or simply rib cage attaches to the thoracic vertebrae. It performs a number of functions. So it forms a protective cage to protect the heart and the lungs and the large blood vessels. It supports the pectoral girdle. So it supports the shoulder. It provides attachment for a whole lot of muscles that are involved in moving the upper body, flexing the back, etc. It also is involved in breathing. First of all, it creates a chamber. It creates a chamber that can be pressurized. And we'll talk about that when we talk about respiration in Bio 112.
but also we have intercostal muscles that stretch between the ribs. Costal means having to do with ribs, inter means between, so these muscles stretch between the ribs and they can forcefully expand or collapse the rib cage to assist in heavy breathing. Ribs connect to the sternum through costal cartilages. The first seven ribs connect directly through their own independent cartilages. They don't share cartilages with other ribs. We also have false ribs though. So ribs eight through 12 either don't connect using their own independent cartilage or they don't connect at all to the sternum. So ribs eight through 10, they share a costal cartilage with other ribs and ribs 11 and 12 don't connect in any way and those are known as floating ribs. Something to take note of because this is a mistake that you see in many online sources and even some textbooks. Floating ribs are a subcategory of false ribs. So we have true ribs, we have false ribs. Floating ribs are a subcategory of false ribs. They're not their own independent category. That's it for our quick and dirty little overview of the axial skeleton. Now what I'm going to do is take a look at the structure of bone and talk about the development of bone. We have two types of bone. We have compact bone and we have what's called spongy bone. Compact bone is made up of units of structure called osteons. Osteons are these cylindrical structures and when you cut them in a cross section, you can see that they're comprised of many layers, like an onion almost. The osteons contain blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves, and also osteocytes. Osteocytes are living cells that maintain the matrix of the bone. The matrix is calcified, of course. It contains minerals that make the bone rigid. Osteons align themselves along lines of stress. And if you stress your bones, let's say you start going to the gym and working out and lifting heavy weights, you grow new osteons and the osteons will grow in the direction of the stress. Spongy bone does not contain osteons. It's not dense and compact like compact bone. Instead, it's kind of sponge-like. So it consists of this network of trabeculae, which are like struts. And the trabeculae will grow along lines of force. We see a lot of spongy bone in flat bones and irregular bones and short bones. So the flat bones that make up the skull, for instance, mostly spongy bone, and then there's a thin layer of compact bone that protects the outer surfaces. This bone is quite light, and the spaces between the trabeculae allow for the presence of red bone marrow. So we have red blood cells, for instance, being made within that bone marrow. We do find some of this in long bones as well. It tends to occur at the ends of the bones. On the bottom left here, you're seeing a diagram of the trabeculae, and you can see that there's lots of spaces between these struts that can contain red bone marrow. In the other diagram, you're seeing a cross section through one of the trabecula, and you can see that we have this laminated structure. And what I mean by that is there's several layers or lamella. The layers contain lacunae. So between the layers, we have these lacunae that contain osteocytes, and those are cells that maintain the structure of this bone. We also have osteoclasts, and what osteoclasts do is they break down bone. Osteoblasts will make new bone. So let's say you're going to the gym and you're working out and you're doing some new exercise that you've never done before. You do that for a while, your bones are being constantly exposed to a new force and the trabeculae may change and align themselves along the direction of that new stress over time. So the osteoclast will break down bits of bone that aren't needed as much and the osteoblast will make new struts in the orientation of that new stress. So we find this trabecular bone again in the ends of long bones and inside flat bones, such as the coxal bones of the hip, the sternum, the bones of the cranium, and also the ribs. The ribs would be considered flat bones. At the top here, we're seeing the structure of compact bone. Compact bone contains these osteons. 
So notice the little diagram right at the top there, it's showing you where this section is taken. We're looking at a long bone, like for instance, the humerus or femur, and you can see in the middle, we have a cavity known as the medullary cavity. That would be where the marrow of the bone is found. And we're taking a wedge from the outer part of the bone. So we have compact bone towards the outside and that gives the bone most of its strength. We have a little bit of trabecular bone that pokes out into the medullary cavity. And then at the ends of these long bones, we'd have much more um, spongy bone. So within the osteon, we have a canal. So we have this canal that runs down the middle and within that canal, we have blood vessels, lymphatic vessels and nerves. This is a living dynamic tissue. We have layers or lamella around that central canal and then we have lacunae between the layers, just like we saw in the trabecula. Within those lacunae, we have osteocytes again, and the osteocytes are going to maintain the structure of that bone. But the osteon can be considered as the unit of construction in compact bone. These long cylinders that once again, like I said, will orient themselves in the direction of stress. Now that we've looked at the structure of the skeleton, let's talk about its development. What you're seeing here is a mouse embryo. And what they've done is they've taken the embryo and they've put it into a solution of potassium hydroxide. And what the potassium hydroxide does is it turns all the tissues clear, turns them almost into a clear jelly. I've done some of these preparations myself and it's a pretty cool technique. The next thing you do is you add some dyes you add a blue dye that will stick to cartilage and you add a red dye that will stick to bone. You wash off all the excess dye and this is what you're left with. So you, again, you're seeing the bony parts of the skeleton in this stage of development as red and the blue is cartilage. So let's take a look at the forearm of this embryo. Take a look at this part here. We've got the ulna and the radius, and you can see that we've got bone in the middle of both of those long bones, but the rest is cartilage. You can see that down here too. If we look at the hind limb, you can see that we have bony parts in the middle of the tibia and fibula, but we have cartilage towards the ends. What's happening is the skeleton was laid down in cartilage first, and then the cartilage is being slowly replaced by bone. That's not what happens in all bones, as we'll see, but that's what happens in the development of long bones. Here you're seeing the same thing with a human embryo, although in this case, they haven't stained the cartilage. So you can see that the long bones are partially ossified, which means they've partly turned to bone, but there's still a lot of clear material, which would be the cartilage. You can see that really well in the fingers. If you look at the skull, Notice that the separate bones of the skull are ossifying, they're forming and mineralizing as separate entities and they're growing together. So for instance, we can see the temporal bone here, but only part of it has been ossified, only part of it has become bone. Flat bones and long bones don't just differ with respect to their shape, they differ with respect to how they develop. On the left, you're seeing a flat bone. Remember, it consists mainly of spongy bone, and the spongy bone is sandwiched between two layers of compact bone. Outside of the compact bone, we have the periosteum, which is a connective tissue that helps maintain the bone and also plays a role in its repair and development. On the right, we have a long bone. This is a mature long bone. You can see that at the end where it's been cut, we have spongy bone, quite a lot of spongy bone, not very much throughout the rest of the bone. So we have that medullary cavity contains a little bit of spongy bone along the edges, but not a whole lot. I should point out, because this can get kind of confusing, as is often the case, there's several different names for the types of bones. We have spongy bone, which can also be known as trabecular bone or cancellous bone. We have compact bone, which is also referred to as cortical bone. Uh, that's the term they're using on this figure. 
The long bone consists of a shaft that's known as the diaphysis. That's the major component of the bone, the major region of the bone. At the ends of the bone, we have structures or regions known as epiphyses. And then in between, we have metastases, meta meaning middle. But we'll come back to those terms in a moment and look at what they mean in more detail. Flat bones develop by a process known as intramembranous ossification. Ossification refers to the deposition of minerals that change connective tissue into bone, essentially. Intra means within, so this is occurring within membranes. Cartilage is not present, so we don't have a framework or model being laid down in cartilage first. Long bones undergo something called endochondral ossification. Endo means within, chondros means cartilage. So what we have here is we have a framework laid down in cartilage, in hyaline cartilage, and then that model is going to be slowly replaced by bone from the inside out. Before we begin discussing these developmental processes, let's reacquaint ourselves with the four types of cells that are found within bone. First of all, we have osteogenic cells. These are stem cells. These are cells that are undergoing frequent mitotic divisions and they can give rise to the other three cell types. You're most likely to find osteogenic cells in the deep layers of the periosteum, that connective tissue that surrounds the bone. Then we have osteoblasts. Osteoblasts form the bone matrix. So they're laying down the connective fibers and also the minerals and so on that are needed to make the matrix of the bone. We have osteocytes that live within lacunae within the bone and maintain the bone. And then we have osteoclasts that can break down bone, reabsorb it, and if need be, release minerals into the blood. In the development of flat bones, we begin with a sheet of undifferentiated connective tissue. This connective tissue contains mesenchymal cells. These are stem cells that are derived from the mesoderm of the very early embryo. They're gonna give rise to osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are going to start releasing osteoids, which are little packets containing all the proteins that are needed to make the organic component of the bone matrix. As they continue to lay down this matrix, some of the osteoblasts will get trapped within the matrix and they become osteocytes surrounded by a space known as a lacuna. The osteocytes and osteoblasts at this point are also releasing minerals into this matrix. And that's a process known as calcification. The most important mineral is a mineral made up of calcium phosphate. The matrix will be shaped into trabeculae. Blood vessels will also migrate into the spaces between the trabeculae. At this point, the mesenchymal cells are also going to start condensing on the outside of the bone and giving rise to the periosteum. At this point, we have the periosteum in place. Remember, the periosteum is composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. And the osteoblasts have migrated to the lower layers of the periosteum. So most of them are going to be situated between the bone and the periosteum. They're going to keep depositing matrix and they're going to make lamella or layers of compact bone. This will be the first layers of compact bone that are formed in flat bones. Now let's compare this to endochondral ossification. Remember this occurs in long bones. So let's say we're talking about the development of the humerus. It's going to be laid out as a cartilage model first and that cartilage will be slowly replaced by bone. So we have mesenchymal cells again, but this time they're going to develop into chondroblasts. And those are the cells that build cartilage. So these cells will build hyaline cartilage. And some of those chondroblasts will become trapped within lacunae, and they're going to become chondrocytes that maintain that cartilage. And this cartilage can continue to grow through the actions of chondroblasts and chondrocytes. With a long bone, we have these three regions in the cartilage model. 
we have what's called the diaphysis. This is going to give rise to the central shaft of the bone. And then we have epiphyses that are found at the ends of the bones. We have a proximal epiphysis, which is found towards the point of attachment of the bone. And we have a distal epiphysis, which is found away from the point of attachment of the bone. Note that mesenchymal cells have also given rise to a dense irregular connective tissue around the cartilage known as the perichondrium, very similar to the periosteum. What's going to happen next is this cartilage model is going to be gradually replaced with bone. We're going to have apoptosis of chondrocytes within the center of the diaphysis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So the chondrocytes will start to die in the middle, and at the same time, mesenchymal cells will move in and give rise to osteoblasts that will start building bone. This happens in a very localized area, and then bone growth proceeds in an outward fashion. And that area where it starts is known as an ossification center. So you're seeing an ossification center here. That's that purple bit in the middle. As the bone is growing, it's laying down bony matrix and minerals, and this material is being calcified. As the ossification center lengthens, it becomes hollow in the middle to form the medullary cavity of the long bone. What's happening there is that the osteocytes are undergoing apoptosis and osteoclasts are coming in and breaking down the bony matrix to form this hollow cavity. Blood vessels are also going to migrate into that medullary cavity. Now notice that we also have compact bone being laid down on the outside of the diaphysis. That's occurring through a slightly different process and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now let's take a look at one of the ends of the long bone. Again, this would be known as an epiphysis. Notice that it's still cartilage at this point. So at this point, the diaphysis has become ossified. It is now comprised of bone and it has a periosteum on the outside. But our epiphysis at this stage is still made of cartilage. What happens next is we have the development of secondary ossification centers within the epiphyses. And you're seeing that here. So we have an ossification center that's formed in the middle of that hyaline cartilage and it's giving rise to spongy bone. At this stage, the secondary ossification center has expanded quite a lot, but it's not fusing to the diaphysis. Instead, we have a region in between the secondary ossification center and the diaphysis known as the epiphyseal plate. And this region contains hyaline cartilage with lots of cells, chondrocytes and chondroblasts that are actively producing more cartilage. This allows for further growth of the bone. The diaphysis can grow in width, and we'll talk about how that occurs in a moment, but to grow in length now, it has to rely on growth that occurs at this epiphyseal plate. Notice that there's also going to be some of that hyaline cartilage left at the surface of the bone, and that's going to form the articular cartilage, that slippy hyaline cartilage that allows for movement between long bones. In this figure on the left, you're seeing an x-ray of a child's knee. On the top, we have the femur, and you can see clearly that the diaphysis is not rigidly attached by bone, to the epiphysis. We have an epiphyseal plate along here that is still made out of hyaline cartilage. And we see that at the bottom of the knee as well, of course, we've got the epiphyseal plate on the fibula and the epiphyseal plate at the top of the tibia. What's happening in that region is we have cartilage that's actively dividing and growing, and that's pushing the diaphysis away from the epiphysis and lengthening the bone. So let's take a look at what the epiphyseal plate looks like under the microscope. At the top, we've got a proliferation zone where cartilage cells are actively dividing by mitosis. And then below that, we have this hypertrophic zone where the cartilage cells are expanding and producing these larger lacunae. What that does is it expands the tissue, and again, it would push the diaphysis away from the epiphysis. As the cells move down further, 
away from that starting location, they're going to start to die. The chondrocytes and chondroblasts will die and they'll be replaced by osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts will start ossifying that material. They'll start converting it from cartilage into bone. So the epiphyseal plate will allow the bone to lengthen and allows you to grow. Once you're full grown, that epiphyseal plate is also going to ossify and it's going to leave sort of a scar known as the epiphyseal line. Now going back to this diagram, we looked at it before. This is a diagram of a mature femur. You can see that epiphyseal line. You can see the epiphyses again. The epiphyses were built from those secondary ossification centers. You can see the diaphysis, which was built by that original ossification center, the first one that formed in the bone. And then the metaphysis is the region that was produced by the epiphyseal plate. So that is the result of growth that occurred after the primary ossification center was done doing its thing. Epiphyses fuse to the diaphysis of a long bone when growth is complete, but these fusions also occur in flat bones. What you're seeing at the bottom is a newborn skull, and you can see that all the bones are there that you know at this point, but many of them are not touching directly. Instead, there are regions known as fontanelles separating them. These fontanelles represent connective tissue that hasn't yet ossified. So remember, these flat bones are formed by intramembranous ossification. That hasn't occurred in the fontanelles yet, but it will. So the fontanelles allow for increased growth of the brain. They also allow the head to deform a bit as it moves through the birth canal. That membrane will become ossified, the bones will touch, they'll form sutures, and in fact the sutures disappear later in life as well, and we'll talk about that in our next topic. In the upper corner, you're seeing the coxa bone, uh, or os coxa. This is one half of the hip, and it's made up of three separate bones. We've got the pubis and the ischium, which are flat bones, and they grow together and they fuse with each other in childhood. And then we have the ilium, which is going to fuse to those two bones in uh, your teenage years. And this will end up appearing as just one solid bone, but it starts out as three pieces. These fusions can be used to age a skeleton in forensic analysis. What you're seeing on the left are the ages at which diaphyses fuse to their epiphyses. And note that these fusion ages occur within childhood and teenage years. In the table, you're seeing the complete fusion of sutures within the skull. We can use this in some cases to age older skeletons. So in elderly individuals, the sutures in the skull are usually completely gone. So the cranium looks like it's just one bone. Irregular bones have several centers of ossification. And in fact, they can also develop through a mixture of endochondral and intramembranous bone growth. What you're seeing at the bottom here is the atlas and axis, which are the first two cervical vertebrae of the neck. Remember that most of the nodding motion of your neck occurs between the atlas and the occipital condyles, and most of the rotation if you're shaking your head no, for instance, occurs between the axis and the atlas. The axis has a very odd little projection that we don't see in any other vertebrae. It's got this thing here, which is known as the dens or the odontoid process. And you might be wondering, where did that come from? Well, if you look at the atlas, you'll notice it's missing something. There really isn't much of a body or centrum here. So if we look at the vertebrae at the top, this big piece here is the body or centrum, and it's quite noticeable in most vertebrae, but you can see it's almost gone in the atlas. Well, what's happened during development is that we did have a body or centrum forming for the atlas, but instead of fusing to the rest of the atlas, it fused to the axis instead. 
to create that pin. And that pin is going to sit into that little groove on the atlas, and it's going to allow for this rotation. All of you have something really weird in your body somewhere that you probably don't know about. All of us are kind of fascinatingly defective in some way. I fell down the stairs several years ago and I went in for an x-ray and they were quite concerned because they thought I had broken the dens off of my axis. But as it turns out, it never fused. So I have the dens, which is about the size of a pea, that's attached rather loosely by cartilage. Um, so I have to be extra careful. If I fall down, I could potentially snap it off. Another thing that's kind of interesting about the vertebrae is they do have their own epiphyseal plates and they have quite a few of them. Um, if we look at the top diagram here along here, that's an epiphyseal plate. If you go back and you look at the diagram that I had of the coxal bones, there's several epiphyseal plates that allow the ilium to lengthen, for instance. There's epiphyseal plates at the ends of the centrum, along here and here, that allow the centrum to elongate so you can grow in height. We've talked about how long bones lengthen, but so far we haven't talked about how they widen. We haven't talked about how compact bone forms within the diaphysis either. So what you're seeing here is growth in the width of a long bone. And two things are happening. Osteoclasts are going to break down bone that's in contact with the medullary cavity so that the medullary cavity can expand. And at the same time, osteoblasts that are found just under the periosteum are going to add bone to the outside. And that will cause the bone to widen and also cause the medullary cavity to widen. The first compact bone laid down on flat bones or within long bones does not contain osteons. Instead, it's laid down as lamellae, so these flat sheets. And you can see the result of that here. So we have these sheets or lamella, and you can also notice that as this was laid down by osteons that were found just under the periosteum, some of the osteons became trapped and gave rise to osteocytes. Now, after several of these layers have been deposited, what happens next is the bone develops ridges and grooves on its surface. Blood vessels migrate into the grooves and run along the grooves. The grooves will deepen and the ridges will wrap around and engulf that blood vessel. Now, notice that the periosteum on the outside of the bone is also being engulfed and it's gonna form something called the end osteum which is the membrane that's gonna line the inside of this tunnel. The whole time this is happening, we still have osteoblasts that are laying down sheets of new bone just under the periosteum. At this point, you can see that that blood vessel has been completely enclosed into a canal, which we can now call the central canal of the osteon or the haversian canal, if you prefer. We're gonna have concentric rings of bone around this canal. And together, that canal and these concentric rings make up an osteon. This is going to continue over and over again. So here you can see that our osteoblasts are still laying down new bone at the surface. Blood vessels are still being engulfed and they're giving rise to new osteons. Bone is a living, dynamic, changing tissue. We've talked about how that's important when it comes to development, but it's also really important when it comes to adaptation and to repair. So there's two parts to restructuring or remodeling a bone. In order to create something new, we have to tear down what was there before. Bone resorption is the removal of minerals and collagen fibers and the breakdown of bone by osteoclasts. Incidentally, resorption is not a typo, despite what PowerPoint might tell you. It's not reabsorption. Resorption refers to the intentional destruction or breakdown of a tissue. Bone deposition is the second part of remodeling. This is where we're adding new bone, and this is being done by osteoblasts. In this tennis player, you can see that her right arm 
is quite a bit more muscular than her left. Now, not only have her muscles adapted to playing tennis, but her bones have as well. So the humerus, the ulna, and the radius on her right-hand side would contain more compact bone than on the left. There's been a number of studies with professional athletes that have shown this. What happens is we have additional osteons being laid down within the compact bone. And this is going to increase the width of the compact bone and increase the amount of stress it can take. But what happens if the bone can't take the stress? Well, it might break. And I thought what we'd do is take a look at a few different types of breaks or fractures. And I should mention, first of all, that break and fracture means the same thing. So some people mistakenly think that a fracture is not quite as severe and maybe it's just referring to a hairline crack. We have, first of all, open or compound fractures. And these are perhaps the most dangerous because in this case, the bone is protruding through the skin. And of course, that's a big problem because that is going to allow for systemic infections, infections that get into the bloodstream and that can travel throughout the, the entire body. So a break like this could be quite deadly if it's not sterilized and taken care of quickly. In a closed or simple fracture, the bones and bone fragments haven't penetrated the skin. And of course, in this situation, we don't have to worry nearly as much about infection. A comminuted fracture is one where the break generates a lot of bone fragments. As you might imagine, this is gonna be more difficult to deal with. It's more difficult to get all those pieces lined up and to get this to heal properly. This is likely to result from an impact of some sort. It could be an impact with a projectile as well, like a bullet, but perhaps you fall and you fall on something. This might generate this sort of fracture. Green stick fractures are far more likely to occur in children than adults. And that's because children and adults differ in the composition of their bone. So children have a higher ratio of protein to mineral. Their bones are not as mineralized. And that makes their bones more flexible, it makes them more resilient in many cases. But the bones, instead of breaking, may bend. If they do break, they break the same way that a green stick would. So if you take a, a branch and it's a dead branch, you know that if you snap it, it'll snap cleanly. If you take a live branch from a tree and try to break it, it'll bend. And if it does break, it might not break all the way through. That's what we see here. So you can see that we have a break on one side that doesn't go all the way through. You can also see in the x-ray that this individual has bent, but not broken their ulna. And this is a really nice x-ray. You can see the ossification centers within the carpals. You can see the uh, epiphyses of the long bones and see that they haven't fused yet. An impacted fracture is where one side of the break is pushed into the other side of the break. So here we have someone that's broken the humerus and the top part of the diaphysis has been pushed into the medullary cavity of the bottom portion of the diaphysis probably the result of someone falling and putting their arm out to stop them. A compression fraction occurs when we have a large force that compresses a bone. An example might be falling off a ladder. Let's say you're on a really tall ladder, the ladder falls backwards, you jump off and land on your feet. All that force is going to be conducted through your vertebral column and it may compress your lumbar vertebrae. A spiral fracture is the result of a long bone being twisted. It's characterized by part of the break running parallel to the length of the bone. There's a kind of a fun way to simulate this. At Christmas, get yourself a candy cane, twist it, and you can quite often recreate this spiral fracture. In fact, candy canes are kind of fun this way. You can recreate most of these fractures with candy canes. An epiphyseal fracture is one that involves the epiphyseal plate. So this is a zone of weakness. It's not ossified. And if you apply shear stress to an epiphyseal plate, it may separate. And that, of course, can be a rather bad thing. Now, again, kids are pretty resilient. So if this happens, 
they can reset them, line up the epiphysis and the diaphysis, maybe even put a pin in there if need be to keep everything lined up. And if the epiphyseal plate isn't too badly damaged, it will repair itself and normal growth will continue. Of course, if it's not fixed, then we're not going to get normal growth at that plate. A depressed fracture is where we have a cavity that's being pushed in. So the best example, of course, would be the cranium. So here we have someone that's received a blow to the head and it's pushed the bone inward. After that goriness, let's talk about how bones heal. The healing of bones is a mixture of intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Bone healing is much more likely to occur and occur quickly if at least part of the periosteum is intact. Osteons contain blood vessels that run through the Haversian canal. And of course, the blood vessels are there to provide oxygen and nourishment to osteocytes and other cells that are found within the bone. Well, if the osteons get broken, blood is going to spill out into spaces within the bone, and it might also pool under the periosteum. Platelets that arrive in the blood will release platelet-derived growth factor. Hopefully that will stimulate the cells that make up the wall of the capillary to divide and repair the damage. We also will have white blood cells that arrive at the scene that can gobble up any bacteria that might have gotten in uh, within reason and also get rid of some of the debris that's being created and some of the cells that have been killed by this damage. The other thing that's going on is we have chondroblasts arriving at the site and the chondroblasts are going to start laying down cartilage and laying down the collagen fibers and the matrix of cartilage. Cartilage should hopefully fill the gaps in the bone, but it might also fill the gaps created underneath the periosteum if the periosteum was pulled away from the bone during the fracture. The next thing that's going to happen is the cartilage cells are going to undergo apoptosis. Osteoblasts will move in and replace the cartilage with bone but we don't have osteons forming this time around. So if we're looking at bone, let's say in a forensic analysis, we can tell if the bone has broken and healed because we'll see this disruption in the osteons. Finally, osteoclasts will come in and they'll remove bone that formed in places it shouldn't. And that would include the bony callus that might have formed underneath the periosteum. However, in many cases, they don't get all of this and you may be left with a lump at the site of the break. Myself, for instance, I had a car accident 25 years ago and I broke my clavicle. I had quite a big lump after the accident. It's gone down, but it's still there. And I don't want to give you the impression I'm accident prone. I'm not, really. And here's our terminology and there is quite a lot of it two pages of it, in fact. But I'm hoping that you find this stuff quite interesting. I know I do.